Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Extreme Desert Challenge. Last time we left off, after advancing Stake to the rank of Praetor, he also gave an inspiring speech to end the episode, so our colony should be in a good mood to start things off today. And we are beginning with a recommendation from last episode's comments. Yes, moving Stake's throne right at the table here, that seems like a good idea to me. Not only does it look a bit nicer, but it also frees up some space. Following that, we are then taking care of a few minor tasks around the base. Things like smelting, cooking, or the construction of another shelf in Stakes and Redhawk's bedroom, before we then tell Edmo to make us some EMP grenades. For some reason, we still don't have any, and mechanoids are definitely becoming more and more of a problem, so having the ability to at least temporarily take them out of the fight, that should give us a nice advantage. Meanwhile, on the other side of the base, we are stepping up our wood production. I mentioned this a while ago, in the future we will grow our cotton in hydroponics basins, and the space that gets freed up that way will be used to grow more cacti. Our colony also keeps growing as Donkey Froom gives birth to a brand new foal. As usual though, I do not plan on having it stick around. In the evening then, our EMP grenades are finished and the rest of the cotton has been harvested as well, so the entire area up here can now be converted into a cactus farm. On the next morning then, our researcher Troy unlocks the marvels of tube television, but I think the steakhouse will actually skip that step and jump right ahead to the much more advanced flat screen television, which will cost us 4000 additional research points, but for Troy that shouldn't take too long. Before he starts working on that, however, it is time to butcher yet another thrumbo. Our kibble supply is once again starting to run low, and with crafting becoming more and more of a common task here in the colony, Edmo is unfortunately often occupied elsewhere, so for a few days now Troy has taken over as the steakhouse's resident cook. Speaking of Edmo and crafting, thanks to a healthy supply of steel he is currently producing component after component, but his next task is going to be a bit more advanced if you will, because up next he will manufacture two bionic arms. We already gave him two bionic legs in the last episode, but I do not plan on stopping there. In terms of raw productivity, the arms are arguably the more important parts anyway, and luckily we have enough plasteel and advanced components to make two of them. Right in that moment, we then also have a combat supplier trade ship pass by, so let's send Redhawk over to the comms console and see what we can do with them. Now, I think this is a great opportunity to sell some of the excess weaponry we have lying around. Sure, it can't hurt to have access to a spare gun here and there, but our current supply is going a bit beyond that. However, we're not only selling, but also purchasing a brand new suit of marine armor. The fights that we find ourselves in are certainly getting tougher, so we can use every bit of protection. Now it may look like it, but our business with this trader has not concluded just yet. Since they are a ship, we can only trade with them what's in the range of our trade beacon, and that beacon is still occupying our old storage room, so let's move it over to the new one and try again. And this time we can make even more money by selling our drugs and a few more weapons. I thought about selling Edmo's heart as well, but I don't think it's time for that just yet. So instead we are holding on to it, at least for the time being. For the rest of the day then, we are in fact slowly emptying out that old storage room. Yes, it will require two trade beacons to cover the entirety of the new one, but I think at this point in the game we can easily afford that. During a short circuit event in the evening, we can then also see that our moisture pump has been doing some good work. We only need to clear two more tiles of soft sand here, and then we can finally close that part of our exterior wall. And because that trade ship is still in orbit, we might as well use it to make a bit more money. So instead of getting some sleep, Troy is spending the evening making flake, which we can then sell for another small profit. Yeah. 
The next morning then begins with what we can safely call surprising news, but certainly of the good kind, because the steakhouse has a new couple to announce, and yes, it is who we all had been hoping for, Edmo and Pollyanna. And I have to admit, the story arc of Edmo is one that I would have hardly been able to write myself. The ups and downs that this man has experienced during his time with the steakhouse are certainly something, but it looks like his times of lusting after Red Hawk are finally behind him, which of course makes the addition of Pollyanna to the steakhouse even more worth it. Unfortunately then, Randy strikes the desert with an eclipse soon after, so our crop production will take a bit of a hit for the next few hours, which shouldn't stop us from continuing to make improvements on that front, as we are putting down three new hydroponics basins here. This time, however, we are only using them to grow rice. Since we have a bit more steel lying around, we are also constructing a second mortar now. I think double the firepower could come in handy, especially against things like sieges or mech clusters, and especially considering that mortars are not the most accurate weapons in the game. Our exterior wall is also making good progress, and so is Edmo at the fabrication bench. The first bionic arm is already being brought over to the hospital, and number two will very likely follow shortly. In the meantime though, we can start another small project, and yes, we are finally doing it, let's construct ourselves a deep drill. We have already detected several underground mineral deposits. At the moment, our most pressing need is of course steel, and this underground vein here should last us quite some time. While we are hauling some of the necessary equipment down there, we are also visited by a caravan, and being a war merchant, they might have some interesting items to trade, although they are part of a tribe, so let's keep our expectations realistic. For the deep drill, meanwhile, we are installing a battery, a switch, and a conduit to connect the drill to, because obviously the thing needs to be powered, but it doesn't actually consume that much energy, so a single fully charged battery will be able to keep it running for at least a few days. Before it's time to go to sleep then, let us also construct a wooden double bed for Pollyanna and Edmo. Edmo's old bed has already wandered off to the hospital. Edmo himself, meanwhile, is currently napping in the workshop, and I would say he has earned himself something slightly more comfortable. And let us not forget about that trade caravan either. They have made it over to us and will now receive some of the items that we no longer have any use for. As I had expected, they do not offer anything that we want to buy ourselves, so let's take the silver for now and hope for something more lucrative in the future. That also brings the day to an end and we can watch Edmo and Pollyanna spend their first night together. In the bedroom on the opposite side, Red Hawk and Steak are getting comfortable, but on the next morning it is time to get back to business. With a freshly constructed deep drill, we now have access to vast amounts of underground steel, but before we start accessing those, Edmo finishes making the second bionic arm, and well, you know what that means. He has made both of them for a very specific purpose, so let us put them to good use. And this time, we are actually letting Pollyanna take care of the operation. After all, she is learning quickly and her medical expertise is only a few steps behind Red Hawk, and considering that her and Edmo just went official, I can imagine she would want to take care of this. The first arm then gets installed without much issue. Number two is following right behind and it will actually remove Edmo's hand talon. That is something that can unfortunately not be attached to a bionic arm, but I think we can live with that. Very fittingly then, the eclipse also comes to an end and the arm is installed successfully. And so Edmo's more or less voluntary journey to becoming a full-on cyborg continues. Shortly after, Alistair is also testing out our deep drill for the first time. The switch here allows us to only draw power when we need it, and as you can see, the drill does not actually consume that much, so this setup should last us for quite some time. And quite some time, that is also what we are going to need to fully empty out the underground steel deposit here. You just saw it, the game tells us that there are 300 units of steel underground here, but that is for every single tile that is marked green, and we have 25 of these tiles, so in total we are looking at 7500 units of steel. 
I think that should satisfy our needs for a good while, although the mining process is not the fastest. Even with Alistair's current mining skill at level 12, it still takes him about 2-3 to three hours to extract one 45 unit block, so he will likely remain down here for a good while longer. Back in the base meanwhile, Edmo is back up on his feet and that is about the most exciting thing that happens before nightfall. With his bedtime fast approaching, Alistair can then also shut off the drill and return back home. And you can see, several hours of mining did not really drain our battery all that much. The next morning then arrives, accompanied by a dry thunderstorm. And perhaps somewhat fittingly, we are starting things off with a not so pleasant task. We have been waiting for quite some time now to find a buyer for our Labrador puppy. But so far we haven't had any luck and our recent animal acquisitions are only eating through our kibble supply, which is something that we unfortunately can't have. The day also continues with more deep drilling for Alistair, as well as with the continued construction of our exterior wall. In the afternoon then, it is harvesting time, and jumping over to Edmo, we can also see that his anesthetic has worn off by now, and so his manipulation skill is finally back up to 100%. Now, actually, it should be a bit higher than that, but that is where the joy wire comes into play. That device is reducing his consciousness to a maximum of 80%, and that of course limits Edmo's effectiveness as a worker. So at this point, it might be worth thinking about removing that joy wire again. However, I believe that is not actually possible in the vanilla game and can only be achieved by replacing it with another brain implant. So let me know what you think about that idea. Do you think it's time for Edmo's artificial happiness to finally come to an end? Or should we simply keep it in there just in case? After another full day of deep drilling then, the first of 25 tiles of underground steel has finally been extracted, but these good news are quickly met with something less exciting, as Husky Natalie has apparently come down with the flu. Now, with some herbal medicine, Poliana should have no issue fixing that, but Natalie will likely need some rest for the next one or two days, which slightly reduces our hauling capacities. On the next morning then, we can continue work in what was once our general storage room. Now it is more or less empty, at least there isn't any stuff lying around on the floor. And speaking of floor, that is what we are currently working on, with some marble tiles to make the place look nice and consistent. The construction of our exterior wall also progresses nicely, and apparently so does Edmo's and Poliana's relationship, as we are now being informed that Edmo has successfully proposed to her and that the two of them are looking to get married. So it seems like the steakhouse's second marriage is going to happen sooner or later. For the time being though, we can watch a busy crowd work the fields, and shortly after, our workshop gets a bit crowded, with Edmo making components, Troy making flake, and Redhawk cutting stone chunks. In the meantime, it looks like our animals have caught a bit of a bad luck streak. This time, Donkey Froom has gotten sick, and with the plague, so once again, let us administer some quick first aid. And with that, another day is slowly winding down, and while Alistair is slowly but steadily mining out his underground steel deposit, Steak has found another one, and this one is actually much closer to the base. So on the next morning, we are moving our mining equipment over there. This will cut down Alistair's traveling times by quite a bit, and keeping him close to the base should be beneficial in case of an enemy attack as well, because that way he can quickly retreat into safety. Around noon then, Troy has the unfortunate task of butchering our animal babies. But what can you do? Our kibble supply is once again running low, and this time we also have some sick animals to feed as well. The rest of the colony meanwhile focuses on plant work and the construction of our base exterior. And so, after a rather uneventful day, we have quickly reached another evening. Things are getting a bit more exciting on the next morning though, However, not quite in the way that I would have hoped for. It looks like the steakhouse is once again getting attacked by mechanoids. This time they are landing in drop pods, and as you can see, there are quite a few of them. 
I actually think that we might have to call for help for this one. In any case, it's a good thing that we made those EMP grenades earlier, as I imagine that those will come in handy. So while our frontline fighters are spending a few moments arming up, we are closing doors and getting into position as we await the onslaught of 19 Scythers. Now, I don't think I have to mention that this has a very real chance of getting ugly. At the very least, I think it's safe to say that our turrets are not going to last that long, but maybe they can do some good damage until they are inevitably destroyed. Our colonists, meanwhile, have already retreated. They are far more valuable than any turret we could ever have. They have also already taken out the first enemy, although it looks like Poliana has suffered a bit in the process. Eventually, then, our colony is assembled, but like I said, we are enlisting some help for this one. After all, we still have two permit points to spend with stake, so let's use one of them to unlock the Genissary Squad, and let us also immediately call them in. A regular Imperial Trooper squad would likely get annihilated in just a few seconds here. These guys, of course, do not really stand a chance either, but they could at least delay the enemies a bit and take down one or two of them in the process. With a heavily armored Jake in the front, our colony is ready to enter the fight now as well, and just in time, as our allies have quickly given up. Still, Alistair lands a crucial EMP grenade and stuns about half of the enemies, while we have created a nice little choke point here, and I have a feeling that this should allow us to do a good amount of damage. Still, this approach does of course not come without its risks, especially Jake is very exposed at the moment, but he is wearing that brand new suit of marine armor we acquired earlier, and let's hope that that is enough to keep him alive. After just a moment, the stun on the Scythus then unfortunately also wears off, but as you can see, even attacking in full force does not really give them much of an advantage, as there is really only one point of attack. The occasional additional stun then also slows down their advance even further, with some Scythers blocking the way for others, and so let's cut a long story short, eventually the Steghouse once again stands tall, but of course success did come with a price. Not only did Jake and Poliana suffer some injuries, although they are relatively minor considering what we just faced, but we have also lost every single one of our turrets, and we will not be able to call in another Janissary squad for the next 50 days, I believe, unless we are willing to expend some Imperial goodwill. But looking on the bright side of things, every member of the Steakhouse is still alive, which can unfortunately only be sad for half of our allies. Of the four guys who dropped in, only two are still breathing and they are in critical condition, so let us place Poliana's old bed in the hospital as well, and then we can have Redhawk treat all four of our patients. The injuries on Poliana and Jake, meanwhile, are actually not too severe. It looks like their armor blocked most of the incoming damage, and so we are looking at mostly scratches and bruises, but luckily nothing that will leave a permanent mark. Rather unsurprisingly than I think, the rest of the day is spent with cleanup and repair work. Disassembling 19 mechanoid corpses will of course also yield us a good amount of steel, which is definitely needed as we are looking to rebuild a good amount of turrets. Still, late in the evening, the day then has one good news waiting for us, as Troy unlocks the secrets of flat screen television. Now, constructing a flat screen TV will cost us 16 components, which is a bit more than we currently have, and likely also a bit more than we are going to have for at least a few days. Once again, those turrets do not come free. Still, thanks to our mining and disassembling efforts, a good portion of them is already rebuilt on the next morning. Poliana is also already fully healed again, so I think it's safe to say the steakhouse has survived another crisis. But of course, survival alone is not what we're here for, we strive for improvement, which is why our animals are now all finally receiving some proper animal beds. This will keep them comfortable and actually allow them to rest a little bit faster, and I think it also improves recovery times for sicknesses and injuries. 
A little late in the day then, I noticed that the Scythus apparently destroyed our moisture pump, which is certainly unfortunate, considering how we were making very good progress. But with only two more tiles left to clear, I am somewhat confident that this is not too much of a setback. A short while later then, Jake has also made a full recovery, and so, as yet another night sets across the steakhouse, our colony seems to be in pretty good shape. As a matter of fact, I think we are actually only one slightly better kill box and two royal ranks for stake away from being able to enter the endgame, in which we are then looking for a way to escape the planet, and we do have a few options here on how to accomplish that. Now, of course, our adventures in the extreme desert are not going to end that soon. Today's episode, however, is because I think we have reached a good point to make the cut. However, to make an already eventful episode even better, we have fan art to show off, and today we have been blessed by not one, not two, but three talented contributors. Up first, we have Quinn Taylor with this fantastic artwork of Edmo making himself a bionic leg, a scene from the last episode, but one that took place in a very similar manner today, and who knows, maybe we'll have him do that a few more times in the future. Our good friend Tofu then illustrated the aftermath of that session at the fabrication bench, with Edmo checking out himself and his new body parts in the mirror, and honestly, not looking too pleased doing so. Finally then, we have something a little different from Tony Murchison. This could very well be considered a bit of a crossover piece, as it shows Tony's interpretation of both colony founders from our two Rimworld series, Cambia on the left and Stake on the right. And I don't think I have to mention that all three of you once again did an amazing job, so thank you very much for your contributions. And with that, let us wrap things up for today. As always, if you enjoyed the episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up, and if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.